Hello, and welcome to the Thread to Mend podcast. In this episode, I'm going to show you a few things about spinning on a wheel. Here I am in my sunroom with my Kromsky minstrel spinning wheel. This is a castle style wheel where you'll see that the orifice um, is positioned off the wheel towards the center uh, rather than towards one end. It's a double treadle with two feet. Um, and this is on a double drive band system. The Kromsky Minstrel offers you um, the ability to spin either double drive or uh, scotch tension, which you would use um, with this bobbin, this little doodad here around the bobbin, holding the tension rather than, I guess, adjusting up here um, to tighten the band. The band in scotch tension is typically a fixed uh, length and it's not adjusted uh, for the tension, rather this is. That's all I know about that. I've only uh, I've only spun on double drive um, and I've only spun on this wheel for the most part. Um, this wheel also comes with a built-in lazy Kate, which is one of the reasons why I purchased it. Um, because that was just one less thing I needed to buy. It also has a really handy little orifice hook and a place to put that. Um, it has two flyers. One is, is it a flyer? Uh, one's, you'll see I have this one here, the smaller one, and there's a larger one here, and you can always store the one you're not using on your wheel. You can just screw that right back on. Um, assembling this was rather easy. There's a YouTube on, uh, video online through Kromsky that you can watch to figure out how to assemble it. And other than the wheel, the only thing I, I think a brand new spinner might need to buy are extra drive bands. And you'll want um, some way to get the yarn off your bobbin. So I like having a nitty knotty so that I can um, put it in a skein form rather than straight into a cake form. So when I sit down to spin, um, the first thing you typically want to do is oil your wheel. I don't always do that, but I happen to have just done that. You oil anywhere there's movement pretty much for the most part. Um, I don't oil the feet. Um, those do move, but don't oil that. Um, and when you're done spinning, you always want to loosen the tension on your drive band, um, whether you're spinning double drive or scotch tension so that you're not putting tension on it unnecessarily um, and it lasts a lot longer. So I do tend to forget to do that sometimes and I think that's why my drive bands run out or wear out so quickly. So I just sat down to spin, I have my fiber um, over here to my right and when you first start, the first thing you'll need to do is put a leader thread on your bobbin. So you can take a scrap piece of yarn tie uh, loops at both ends, and you're going to lasso the loop, uh, the string through the loop to get it on the bobbin. And you want to do that in the direction so that when you twist the bobbin clockwise as you spin your singles, that it puts tension on it to pick up the string. So I don't have a leader, well I do have a leader thread on here, but what's coming off the bobbin is some extra yarn that I have left over from a time that I double plied two uh, bobbins of singles together. There was some leftover singles on one bobbin. And when I'm continuing to spin with the same fleece material, I'll often just pick up on where I left off with the previous bobbin, even if it's a different color. Um, and then if I happen to have extra on the opposite bobbin, I'll ply those two together and I'll get a very small mini skein of uh, one-off marled yarn. That's just how I roll. So the first thing you're going to need to do is put the leader thread on the bobbin, and then you'll have to bring the leader thread through the orifice. You want to start on one end of the bobbin. I don't think it matters if you start away from you or towards you. Um, here I have some fiber built on the bobbin, so I'm starting at the middle, and you bring the yarn over the hooks. The orifice tool goes in through the front, out the side hole, and you pick up that yarn and pull it through. I'm always careful that I don't let my uh, yarn, touch the oil at the leather and metal portion here because it is oiled. So um, I'm, I often start my wheel with my finger just to get it going in the right direction. These uh, footmen on this wheel are 
connected to the treadles with leather straps so this wheel will often sometimes make a little bit of sound in that space and that's why you might hear clicking. So I started to pedal my wheel and I adjusted the tension by tightening or loosening this wooden screw here which puts more or less tension on this drive band. Anytime I am doing that I'll often want to tap with the my hands the drive band like you would the strings of a guitar or something like that where you're kind of testing you know is this anywhere near where it should be and I like to start out a little loose and then start spinning and tighten it up to the right amount of tension. Otherwise if you start too tight it might just rip it out of your hands and you'll have to start from the beginning pulling the leader thread back through the orifice. So I have my fiber supply here. This is some hand combed Cormo fiber that I naturally dyed. Um, so you might see it's a kind of soft canary yellow. That's not the natural color of this fiber. And there's a couple ways to pick up fiber. You could pinch it right at the end if you're maybe you just lost your fiber supply um, and you've already been spinning for a minute. Or you can kind of feather up the tip and catch it a few inches forward and pull it back and have a few inches where the fiber kind of blends with the established yarn. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to just lower this tension a little bit. So I'm picking up that fiber, putting some tension on it, I'm going to pinch these together. So the first couple inches I don't worry about. I'm just getting the yarn on the bobbin and figuring out my tension. You're not wasting a lot by giving yourself a little bit of time to get acquainted. Alright. So you can always do a ply back test where you ply the yarn back on itself and kind of get a gauge for how much twist has been put into the yarn. So this is a pretty balance. I don't think you can see this from that far away, but I know that I have a decent tension here and you can adjust this as you need. When you start to build yarn on the bobbin, your tension is going to have to be adjusted as the height comes closer to the um, hooks and often that means that I tighten it up just a little bit. So I have my uh, fingers pinched between where the twist is at the fiber and the rest of my fiber supply. And I'm holding the fiber supply in my dominant hand, in my right hand. So I'm going to continue spinning and I'm going to show you the for short forward draw method. I'm pinching off the fiber, pulling my left hand forward, and then drawing my fingertips back to allow the twist into that fiber. Now that fiber has been drafted to a particular uh, volume or girth or quantity of fibers um, that I, I suppose I want in this um, gauge of singles I'm creating. So what I do is I, I kind of just draft the fiber so that it's consistently thin. Um, and I try to go at a steady pace between my feet and my hands. So um, you'll see that I'm, I'm pedaling very slowly here, but I'm also spinning on one of the smaller, um, I actually don't know the number exactly, but uh, you know, there's ratios. So you might see that one flyer gives you 12 to one or eight to one or something like that. I actually haven't taken the time to figure out what each of them are. Um, I just learned by feeling and doing. So when I started, I started on the biggest whirl. And you might want to do that for a while. I only switched to this one last week, and I've been spinning for about a year. So the bigger whirl is going to allow you to spin slowly and put more twist in slowly, whereas with the smaller whirl, you're spinning slowly, but you're putting a lot of twist in quickly. And you can imagine that it putting more twist in slowly is going to give you a little bit more time to draft your fiber and these are all um, this is a skill that you developed through feeling and doing by practicing it doesn't always come to you from reading a book um, unless maybe that's how you learn really well um, 
of course, books are really helpful. One thing I did do is take out every spinning book from the library and skimmed each and every one of them from cover to cover, reading the portions that I thought were relevant to my um, experience of learning, you know, skipping over parts that I just read previously in other books. Sometimes, you know, every book is going to have some overlap. Um, but books are amazing resources. I'm just going to move my fiber to the next hook because I've built up some fiber here. And I'm going to keep spinning. You want to make sure that you're continuing to spin in the same direction. Um, it, it can be, uh, it's happened, you know, where you just like spin in the wrong one and you're like, whoa, wait, what's happening right now? And, um, it's okay to sometimes stop and just pull off a few inches of yarn you just spun if it didn't come out the right way or the way you intended. Um, better to do that than have some blemish in your your yarn um, that you don't want to live with. Um, you can see that I just picked a little bit of fiber off. Sometimes um, a small piece of fiber will get kind of worked in without being drawn in a nice smooth single direction. Um, that happens more often with hand combed fiber than maybe your commercial top or robing. Um, and I just let the twist go over it and I'll pick it off and then I'll try to smooth it out. And I smooth it out in this direction because when I ply the single back with another, it's going to be smooth in that direction again. So that might be helpful to you. Now sometimes you might see that I just did a um, sort of a backward draw where maybe my fiber supply got a little too draft too drafted forward, and I I actually um, kind of pull the fiber. Well, I'm not sure if that's the reason why. It's just sometimes you're drafting the yarn forward, sometimes you're drafting the yarn back. Um, if you keep switching between the two, it might have a subtle uh, impact on the yarn, but I find that whatever gets me the right amount of fiber in my spin, meaning I want to draft a consistent amount in each inch or so, um, that's what I do. And I try to just maintain throughout a very consistent amount of fiber in the twist. If the twist is a little variable, I, I feel like that's okay. That's going to come out uh, when I ply the yarns together. It'll be a little more consistent. And then after I do some finishing techniques to the yarn, that will sort of assist in evening out the spin as well. Um, some people become really technical with exactly where their hand is placed and at what angle and exactly how many inches per mini um, petals of the feet they, they spin. I am not that spinner yet. Um, I don't know that I ever will be, but one thing you can do is you can use a pillow on your lap. I have a couple here. These will get dirty if you're using fleece that's not, you know, commercially scoured. So just be mindful of that. Like that maybe don't use your best pillow or one that you can't kind of launder in one way or another. So um, and this is kind of nice if you just want to rest your hands a little. It's also nice if you're watching maybe uh, YouTube or something from your phone or your iPad. I'll often position my iPad right here because I'm looking at my yarn and I can kind of see what's going on generally and, and not be looking away and not noticing what's going into my yarn. So that's a tip. And what those spinners who are very particular about where their hands are and how they draft, they might put a piece of tape or two and kind of mark where their hand should pick up and where it should stop the forward draw. A forward draw does give you a smoother and more consistent yarn. That's why a lot of people first learn the forward draw first. Um, there is another technique, and there are many techniques, but there's one major, ma not majorly different, but kind of um, people often position another technique opposite the short forward draw, which is the long draw. And the long, draw, it, the long draw is often used with fiber that's not worsted prep, such as this, but is a woolen prep uh, fiber. 
meaning that the fiber is prepared and sort of brushed out in a way that the fibers are not all individually facing the same direction, but they might be kind of turned on themselves. Um, the fibers are all facing different directions, and you get that roving or that bump or that bat by using a carter rather than combs. Um, and somehow um, it's just easier. I'm not going to show you here because I'm, I'm not great at it. I, it's not something I've practiced a lot, but you would, um, I think, bring the fiber back, letting the twist into it. So you, you either have maybe a sturdy fiber or a long wool fiber, something with a long stable length, and you kind of let the twist on it, and you let the twist and the drafting together kind of establish the thickness of the yarn. Um, but I'm just going to continue with a short forward draw. And something I meant to mention right at the start, which is really important to me, is that you want to make sure when you're spinning, especially for long hours, that you have a seat that is um, most appropriate. So I'll just get into a personal story. I was spinning one weekend for several hours. I think it was like anywhere from 10 to 14 hours. I don't know how many breaks I took, but it was it was a long, long day. I was just totally engrossed in this project. And I was sitting at my low frame couch. And while I was um, sitting there for that length, the position of my hips relative to my wheel and or my feet at the treadles was in a greater amount of flexion, so flexion of my hip. And so my knee was a little bit higher than my hip. And what that did with the repetitive motion for that length of time in a single day was it shortened through a muscle or tendon here. And that created a cascade effect where my SI joint kind of pulled out of place forward. My piriformis muscle, which kind of holds it together and, and structurally stable, was freaking out a little bit because it was working really hard to not let this tension adjust everything. And um, because I was sitting for so long, my deep rotators, those other smaller muscles that help to support the pelvis, kind of stopped firing and they weren't pulling their weight. So the piriformis muscle, which is the bigger of the gang, was like, hey guys, you're not doing your job. Now I have to do it for you. And it spasmed. It was overworked. It was, it was clenched tight and wouldn't let go. And the thing about the piriformis is there's a nerve that runs through it or next to it. Everyone's different. And it squeezed around that nerve. So I had muscle pain of my piriformis deep in my butt. I had joint pain at my pelvis and I had nerve pain through the sciatic nerve. It got so bad that there were days where I couldn't get out of bed or get into bed without crying. There was one day where I physically couldn't move myself from the couch upstairs into bed and my husband carried me there. And that night I had to get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only made it to the toilet because I had to make it to the toilet. And I literally slept on the floor by the radiator in the bathroom for a couple more hours before I got up that morning because it was bad. So that's how important it is you find the right seat for your spinning. You can see that I'm in my hanging chair. And the thing I like about this, and I actually bought this before I bought my wheel, but it can be adjusted height-wise by the chain it that holds it up. So I can move this seat taller if I need to or lower if I need to. When I'm sitting at my wheel, my knees are just below my hips while my uh, while they're at the tallest. Um, the knees don't bounce a lot if you're using your ankles, but if you're, you know, whatever. Your knees might lift and lower. So you want to make sure that when your knees lifted at the highest that it's still in line with the hip or maybe a little lower. You don't want it higher than the hip. I can, I can feel exactly where that shortens there. Right, so you want to make sure, you might even just poke your hands into your hips and 
and make sure that it's not getting too contracted when your knee is lifted. The difference between my knee being here and here is incredible if you just touch your body right there. So if you're in a proper seat, you can spin for hours and probably not be sore, but you might also want to practice outside of spinning that helps to stabilize your pelvis, strengthen your legs so that maybe you don't experience fatigue if spinning for long hours is something you're wanting to do. Um, it is a very sedentary practice, so it's important to bring balance to your life and do things that are active and strengthening um, or maybe increasing flexibility on your low back so that you're not um, strained in sitting. So when you're sitting, you want a nice neutral pelvis. It's not spilling forward. It's not spilling back. You want it sitted upright as if it were a bowl of water and it's not shifting in either direction. Right, knees below hips, and then you should be set. Um, they do sell matching seats for wheels. I've never sat at one, and I can't guarantee you that it's the right height. I don't know that they ever put that into consideration. Um, you can elevate your seat with like pillows and blankets, but the thing I noticed about that, which I tried to do on my low, low frame couch, was that it just was always lumpy or bumpy. Every time I sat down at my wheel, I'd have to go make sure I found the right materials and that it was just right, and it kind of would often get pushed to the side, and then I would sit in an angle that was not appropriate for a lot longer than I can, should admit. So that's everything I have to show you today about spinning on a wheel. I hope this video is helpful to you. If it is, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I want to thank you so much for watching, and um, have a great day.